Thank you so much, Mina, for joining us. Uh, so exciting to have you. Well, thank you so much. It's my great pleasure to be here. Really an honor. Thank you. Um, if you can just introduce yourself and the organizations that you are representing, it would be great to get started. All right. Yes. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, uh, actually, I could just start saying that uh, I've been, I have been several years management and leadership experience, both in private and public organizations. So I have had my hands into their the, the health sector, business ecosystems, innovation, financing, and, and so on. Um, my recent positions at the government funding agencies and innovation organizations like your Business Finland and Shitra. So uh, those have also enabled me to, to tap into the national, Nordic, and EU level health sector innovation strategies and policies. In addition to my kind of work, normal daily practice, I think. I've been uh, been quite much involved in uh, in kind of thought leader and influencer type of uh, activities, especially in the international networks. Uh, I'm, I belong to the World Economic Forum Expert Network in healthcare and in the future of healthcare, and especially now when I'm uh, on their second and from business Finland to Citra. I'm facilitating the journey towards European health data space as a part of the European Commission's data strategy. And uh, actually, I'm, my, I'm, a, I'm a molecular biologist, biochemist by training, but, uh, and I have a PhD in that, but uh, I haven't been to the lab for the last, let me say, 25 years. So maybe that shortly. That's exciting, um, especially, I mean, at this time of the um, situation that we are, I mean, the world is dealing with the COVID. Um, how do you evaluate the current healthcare system generally uh, across different countries? And then we, we get to your... Hmm. Well, as we all know, there is a lot of diversity between different healthcare systems. And, and ex especially now they have been really exposed something, I think, that we have never never kind of experienced before um, and uh, all the governments they have definitely tried to do the best and with those resources they have had and and uh, I think that no one could really never expect that something like this would ever happen that happened now with COVID but uh, what I have realized that um, especially those healthcare systems where you where you have a kind of basics is in the public healthcare system that covers the whole population. And especially where the healthcare system is collaborating with the private one. So this kind of public private partnerships against, I think shows its strength, even in this kind of extreme period that we are now expecting. Um, so yes. Yeah, as yeah. you mentioned, okay. there's there's been so many VCs, uh, sp specifically during COVID. I mean, uh, last quarter uh, of 2020, and uh, or even like this year, 2021, that they've been investing in uh, mainly, uh, you know, private startups in like er early early stage startups, mm. um, and um, and also specifically healthcare um, sp and uh, telehealth. Um, how do you? see that? I mean, um, since you're also working with the World Economic Forum. Mm. Well, this, you know, this has really been a, been a boost for, if I call it telehealth or mobile connected healthcare services. And uh, I think that has also been, a, been kind, of a, uh, kind of a success factor for those advanced economies where you already have infrastructure services established and people are, are keen to use digital, digital tools. It's not only to, to, to handle the current COVID situation, but uh, we have uh, all the other health issues that we are facing at the same time. And you should take care of if you have diabetes, if you have whatever you have, you have to be in contact with your physician and the healthcare service services so uh, that has enabled also those societies and and to to keep care to take care of their, their citizens and population even though that you have had so much restrictions on on going to certain places but uh, in terms of your know, what you ask about uh, this digital health and telehealth care i think this is now the ebindo has opened 
in that sense that uh, before it's more it's more, more or less like a pushing and pushing where everybody knew that well we have the technology available and 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 the services and platforms but they haven't been a pull really from on the other end and also i guess now citizen has they have realized the importance of of data data sharing and and uh, digital literacy and all kinds of things so i am very i'm very kind of confident that we will see a totally different era now for those those uh, solutions which are available one example is that uh, in finland um uh, just recently uh, uh, read a paper that uh, that uh, one of their our private healthcare service providers which are, they are already also doing the occupational health services quite much they say that uh, they are they have uh, they mobile or connected physician uh, doctor services they have increased nowadays to the level of 40% of all their all the visits are now digital or mobile so it's quite a quite a big amount of if you think that you don't have to really uh, travel or or it's it's very convenient then contact less well th- before yeah. there was the concern about um, data and obviously privacy mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. the health data uh, and with the covid um they had to ease that kind of like regulation and how do you think that perhaps the the topic is being considered right now and uh, g- given the fact that there's so much legacy data and uh, silos of health data uh mm. you know within the um uh ownership of the hospitals or the patients themselves or the governments obviously each jurisdiction in each country each mm. you know geography is different in terms of the their regulation so how do you see that uh, specifically with the innovation and technology that we see that there's like so much tools and so much new technologies are being developed that they can actually utilize and convert these um data into very um scientific and uh a helpful you know research and diagnostic for example pipelines that could be used but unfortunately they're not at the moment well you are absolutely right <laughs> the data plays a key role in addressing some of the most complex problems um, and uh, of the rapidly changing world not only not only the covid it now and uh and and uh so the data should be shared between different parties seamlessly and transparently and and also to then this way to contribute to the to the better research and innovations and but uh, as you mentioned that uh, there is huge diversity now in countries uh, in the legislation policy even the strategy but also in the cultural in terms of culture how how things could be how this data could be used and promoted for for not only even for the primary purpose but also for secondary purpose so for the research innovation and decision making purposes um trust is must of course transparency security but uh, but you have to really build the framework for these things and um, europe has uh, now a uh, taking a uh, huge steps in that so a year ago the european commission launched the data strategy not only related to healthcare because the, of course the data it doesn't doesn't uh, kind of stay in one domain your right. your your mobility data can be health data your, your, your weather data like we were talking about the pollen it it can be uh, your health data so europe has this kind of a journey towards the the joint data in in Europe we are come talking also about a joint health data space where the data can be shared for 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 different purposes seamlessly trustworthy respecting people's rights and and across the borders across the silos but it means a lot of work not only for the infrastructure data quality but also policy issues ethical issues but we are now on the way there are a lot of initiatives now now uh, uh started and uh, and i hope that uh we can at some point uh also join these connections because it's not europe is not it's not only the one thing matters we have to work in global arena so right. to making this homework well done 
I hopefully we can link even better to U.S. or Asia. Um, so, um, I mean, it, it's a great uh, news that the, Europe has launched this kind of like initiative. And at the same time, they also have GDPR, which kind of like mm -hmm. restrict um, outer EU jurisdiction to have access to that data. How, um, how, how is EU planning to uh, counter kind of like play that role? Well, yeah, the GDPR is very important. And, and uh, when implemented in the right way, it's, it's, it shouldn't restrict. I know that there are a lot of discussion, especially among scientists and researchers, how GDPR at least hinders the collaboration to, to US, for instance. But, uh, but for instance, the, the coming data covenants, covenants act in, um, in Europe and others, they are, will be compliance with the GDPR. And, and I think we can't step on the their, 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 their citizens and their rights, but we need to really change the way how we do these things. And how do you see the role of um, new technologies like machine learning, AI, um, even like blockchain uh, that could actually play a role in, in healthcare? I mean, I, I'm, I'm assuming that these discussions are all the time being discussed. <clears throat> in the European Union, um, in, mm. in World Economic Forum. Mm. Um, it would be great if you can also uh, tell us a little bit. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that's a very important, important question and, and thing. Um, healthcare has, I think it still has been quite far behind the other sectors in harnessing, harnessing mm. these digital technologies, exponential technologies. And it's and been quite, um, I think it's, it's because, uh, well, healthcare sector, if we go really to the regulated healthcare, when we are current people, it needs to be regulated. And if there's a lot of, uh, uh, not, I, I would say that restrictions, but regulations you have to, to, to cover, uh, validations, uh, clinical trials, that things are really doing what they're supposed to do. And it's not harmless. And, and the whole system has built in this this kind of quality, quality system and clinical trials. And it's very difficult to get new technologies and innovations um, kind of spike into the traditional already, already proven uh, care or drug or whatever treatment it is, because it has to, has to show that uh, there is a big increase in the, in the outcome in a way or another. And we have also... Um, there are missing certain uh, tools, for instance, for digital health assessment of those uh, apps, for instance, of their, uh, their, uh, that if there are, uh, if the care is better, if you use com the combination kind of with the app, some kind of virtual therapy combined with a truck, and, and it's, uh, it, may, it needs a lot of money, a lot of time, and also our systems, they are built with the past. I mean, the, the current current world and current systems. So those systems and assessments, they need to be also changed. And things happen gradually. So I think also why healthcare has been slow is also that, that the system has protected us. But we have to find the balance where, they're, where they're, the newer, better things are really, the outcome is better than the, the old ones. But... Uh, I think we are on the way. So definitely AI is changing everything, but then we come to the issue, ethic of issue, et ethics related to AI. Very interesting question. Uh, we don't have much use cases yet where we have really shown in real life how it works, what kind of things may come up. Robotics yeah. is already actually, I think that's the easiest one. It's already involved 3D printing or um, just uh, we are AR. I think they are coming. We are talking already talking about virtual therapeutics. Uh, we are talking about decentralized clinical trials where we get all these kind of new tools into. But yeah, there are there. We just uh, need to, to change things to get them involved. So, uh, so in order to use these fascinating technologies. Uh, what, what are the key factors that we have to keep into consideration as you are working in the policy side? Is it uh, regulation? Is it uh, 
uh, kind of like vetting on the technology, as you said, that it's kind of like ethic. Mm-hmm. Obviously, we have to vet on that. And that's that comes from the coding, you know, uh, and computing of uh, putting those codes into that. At those like, um, for example, the machine learning or AI is not being biased towards, mm-hmm. you know, certain algorithm and so forth. So what are the, the factors that uh, are going to be kind of like accelerating the process uh, and the benefit of the healthcare and healthcare system? So you mean that what will accelerate their, the integration of AI in, in the adoption? In, yeah, Adopted. In the adop- adoption. yeah, I think it should. Um, well, I think we already have the technology is there, uh, but we have to approach from the both ends. It doesn't it, it's not enough that we kind of change policies, we make, we make regulations and, and things like that, but we have to somehow get people involved and understanding of things for the citizens, because that's what the end in the end of the day matters, that we right. are doing all this for, for people and people's health. And often, and I, I could say that even in most of the cases today, politics and, and, and policies and regulations are done by organizations and, and governments and, and outside people's real life. So how to get them involved? And, and maybe one is thing could be to increase the, the, not only the digital literacy, but also the literacy of uh, um, people's uh, understanding of their health and well-being, how, how the data, how technology can be um, can be beneficial for them. And um, I've seen many times that kind of you, uh, you kind of assume that people will adapt things that, okay, these are given to you, you just start using this app or, or equipment or device or, or this service, but if they can't find any reward for them. So what is this for me? Right. And, and so um, I think they should, things should come from their, several ends and then we come to one of my my favorite topics is this this ecosystem type of co-creation co-innovation and and not only with the organization but also how you get the people involved yeah that, that's a great topic and yeah. actually you you pointed at, at, at a great uh point uh which is about kind of like rewards, right? So incentives. Um, and w- we also see that there's like two sections here, um, uh, two set of data. Uh, one that is actually being covered by the healthcare system through each country and each jurisdiction. Um, mm-hmm. Anything out of the healthcare si- system would be belonging to the public and individuals themselves, right? Um, for example, like Fitbit, data i it's like it's open i can provide it i can give consent to any app or any kind of like service provider or even like an internet or a browser to have mm-hmm. access to that but for me to to get access to my health data from for example a hospital from my family doctor perhaps i need to request that data which i am not the owner um, I have to request that from the system, which is the government, or it could be mm. the hospital, which is the private section. Um, I, I need to request that, and that has to be released. Um, in, in some countries, they don't even give that to, for, for example, individual themselves. It, it would uh, go directly to their family physician. How do you see that? Well, obviously, there's like so much fragmentation of the system mm. and the data here. It's it's so much complicated. Uh, that I, for example, as an owner of that data, I would say, you know, like, I don't, I don't need that data, right? It's just like, you know, spare me, um, just because of the hassle and everything. I have to go through, you know, different bureauc- bureaucracies to get to get that data. And what is your perspective on that? And do you think, as an influencer in the healthcare, um, how would you approach that problem? Well, a huge problem, um, but uh, I, I agree that I think we all should own our own data, we should have access to the data, we should have a right to, to give the consent or, or at least we should know what, where my data has been used. Uh, the situation is very different in different countries, as you already described. Uh, for instance, in Finland, I, I, I can access my, my clinical data from, mm-hmm. from the portal. In Finland, we have this Kanta service, the national re- repository where the, the private and, and, and uh, 
public health care, my data goes. So I can go there and, and it's, it's not only the data, it's service portal. So I can renew my prescriptions. I can see my, my, my files, my things. And uh, so, uh, and also there is now development that I can even add my data there. So this is my mm. lifestyle data. There is this kind of portal, but, uh, but it's, it's, it's a very weird, um, difficult question that how that should be a approach and, and uh, how it should be a kind of solved. Then we have to go back to their basics and, and to their, do the strategies and the policies and different countries. So right. how you want to organize it and, and can you learn from each other? And it's, it's not an easy easy task and uh, this is exactly what here in Europe we try to do in this European data strategy and 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 towards European health data space that that can we also uh, get there that kind of space in Europe where the data you you can kind of go across borders or actually you have an access to your data whether I go for instance um, to to physician in in my holiday in Spain, and I will be treated there. So can I can that data be then locked into my files, which are now currently in Finland? So there are some initiatives already between, for instance, Finland and Estonia now for the prescriptions. So you can uh, change the prescriptions in both countries and have access to your medicine. So, but. Uh, there are many aspects. There's no, no simple answer for this, but I agree. But then there is an also non angle that, that uh, is interesting to talk about sometimes, and I don't know if you have time today, but uh, should, uh, should I always be asked for consent in all the situations? Uh, is there some situation where you, for instance, in the public health care that is related to your primary uh, kind of data for your clinical um, uh, treatments, for instance, in a certain situation. So should that be something that can be used to measure, for instance, the efficacy and, and efficiency of their treatments and outcomes to improve the organization so that, for instance, if I get treatment for my cancer and, and, and they want to say that whether these are working. So I think there we all, all also come to this kind of balance and, and, and am I capable also to make all the decisions by myself, even so that it, is it, it might harm me if I don't give their information. I mean, you're right. Um, it's it's <clears throat> exactly like the circular economy. Mm. Your clinical data to be used for efficacy, we saw how important it was for the vaccine mm. uh, operation, Absolutely. right? And we don't... Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. And we don't have that... a very operation. good example now. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. Unfortunately, mm. unfortunately, we don't have that. But but Europe, at least, um, I mean, the European members can can share that data just because of the GDPR, perhaps. And you know, they have there is kind of like a level playing field for each country that they, they can trust each other, perhaps, and and share that if if necessary. Um, but mm. uh, but it's not, and and I think it's probably another. Um, factors that uh, that's been brought up by COVID. And now we're talking about COVID. Um, what do you expect to see for the rest of this year uh, in terms of like the uh, the most kind of like uh, changes in the healthcare and the health data perhaps? And perhaps um, we would also see in the future that uh, that has been uh, kind of like created as a result of COVID. I think COVID, COVID is rewriting the rules now again. Totally. Mm. It, it will be, we won't go back into the same world we were. We were. Um, it will be some kind of new, new world, new, new age. And um, especially, I think um, it's not only the healthcare, because healthcare is not in the silo, but, but also other sectors of the whole societies. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure that, um, that there, uh, most of the world now starts to put more emphasis on the prediction and prevention part, mm -hmm. which has been the mantra for the last 10, 15 years in healthcare, that we really have to shift the paradigms kind of to their, to their 
prevention and prediction instead of acting when we have really something bad happening. Right. So, and how we can do it, it is that we should have the data, we should share the data, get the data from several sources and this trust. And also this, I think COVID has shown after the power of public-private partnerships that can. For instance, the vaccines have been a very good example. Surely there have been some challenges or problems, but well, things, that's, that's how the life is. But I hope that we have now learned and also this kind of, uh, um, maybe there uh, kind of altruism also. There is a balance now this, between this nationalism like the people, but there is a nationalism, nationalism that, uh, and you want to just secure your own country or your own continent. But on the other way, we are all in the same boat, like this in Finland. And if you don't share, if you don't give, in the end of the day, you won't gain yourself. So a, exactly. we are now in the capacity of the limitation of the of the whole whole globe, the the, the earth. Yes, that, that's a great point, because we saw during COVID that even though they were closing the borders in order to prevent um, yeah. uh, the pandemic or epidemic, yeah. I mean, it didn't help. The, mm. the yeah. virus did you know, migrate, right? Mm. But this may also, I, I'm, th- I'm sure that it will also uh, <clears throat> um, uh, change um, as the business models and the industry quite much that uh, before we were living this globalization thing, you had a factory in one place and another place you had, a, uh, you got the kind of other pieces of things or, or uh, supply chains or whatever. They were huge logistical or jungle, but I can see that now many of the companies had ever reconsidered that which are those critical things you should have close by or at least in your, that you can really, really or somehow manage them. And also the governments. Like in Finland, mm-hmm. we have had the discussion now about should we have our own vaccine production in Finland? Because we gave it up about 20 years ago because it was too, too expensive and, and so on. So now there are serious discussions on that. Well, that, that's also a great point. Mm. Um, now, even countries are trying to, to have, you know, that produced or manufactured in-house. Mm. So that's also sure. another advantage as perhaps uh, COVID has yeah. brought us. And what yeah. are you focusing on right now? What are the, uh, how's your rest of the year looking like in terms of like healthcare and influencing <clears throat> and the, the t- topics that oh. you're going to be focusing on? Wow. Yeah. Actually, um, well, there will be uh, in, in terms of influencing, I could say that, um, there are a couple of um, big events coming. There will be this HIMSS, HIMSS conference coming in June. I will be talking about uh, data and, and health data and, and public trust, surprisingly. <laughs> in that panel, it's um, the HIMSS and this uh, Health 2.0 conference is digital in June. Uh, then there is Portugal is the, has a, holds the presidency of, of EU now. And then there is this eHealth Summit that is uh, on the side of the, the, the EU presidency meeting. So I will be also there in panel, also discussing about health data, trust people, what are all these kinds of things. You can have a look at that. It's also be also very interesting. We will have some commission people also working on that, talking on that. And uh, But then, of course, it's this whole European health data space things. And, mm-hmm. and we just ramp it up this February with the 25 other countries. And, and the idea of this data joint action is to help the commission and member states for the collaboration in building this, this European health data space. So uh, that we will have a lot of hands and work because the first proposal for commission should be ready in the end of this year for, their, for the Data Governance Act and this health health specific part of that. So that, that takes quite much of efforts. And, uh, but otherwise, I think everybody is waiting for that the world will open and the vaccination will continue in, uh, in all the countries. And Finland, we are almost approaching that 40% of the population is being vaccinated. 
and and our situation has been pretty well good all the time but but of course people want to to travel and get people come over here and and gradually get back to some kind of uh, maybe not the 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 new normal i could say well that's uh, that's exciting to hear at least uh, that you know the new normal is coming yeah, and also the health data which is a very interesting topic sp- specifically for this year and perhaps i mean for the next five to 10 years. So we will see how that uh, topic is going to be also developing. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, do you have any further comments or any further recap? No, I'm, I, this was, has been very nice. I'm, I'm very happy to, to be here with you, as well. And, and uh, I think we will all have still a lot, lot work to do, but we are on the right road and, and let's work together towards the healthier and better world.